Hi, welcome to my second video on developing a valuation model for Chipotle Mexican Grill. A couple of thoughts that I wanted to share before I get too far into this video, and I'll probably repeat some of these things as we go. But one of the important things in building a financial model is to recognize that these models are going to be very imprecise. As a matter of fact, this is an example of one of the concepts that I think is essential to understanding finance, and that's the idea of false precision. Because we use a lot of assumptions in finance and we develop models and put them into things like Excel, we're going to get very precise answers. When I come up with a value for Chipotle Mexican Grill, it's going to be down to the penny. However, the actual value is going to be much broader than that. I think it's worthwhile to think of your valuation as an approximate range. Maybe if you're lucky, your price is, your range is about 25% above or beyond that price. So really take your answer with a grain of salt. As we change some of the assumptions, you're going to see that changes the value and sometimes significantly. And there are a lot of assumptions that go into this. Another thing that I want to stress is that the purpose of this is to illustrate the valuation model process more so than to be a buy sell recommendation for Chipotle. One of the things I'm recording this video in early July 2020 information is going to change constantly. If you're watching this in 2021, Chipotle stock price is going to be different. Chipotle's environment is going to be different. The valuation I developed today is not going to be that meaningful. Also, other smart people are going to look at Chipotle and come up with different assumptions. Some people will use different models. If you remember in the previous video, I mentioned that a big focus of my valuation process is that when I value a stock, I think of a stock as a piece of a company. So what I'm going to be doing in this valuation model is trying to figure out what Chipotle Mexican Grill as a company is worth and then divide that by the number of shares outstanding. Other people use different processes. Some people use technical analysis. Some people use relative valuation measures like price earnings or price book multiples. Lots of different approaches. My model is going to be a free cash flow to equity model or discounted cash flow model. And that is how I think of valuation. Doesn't mean that's the only way to think of valuation. So it's important as you go through these videos to take a little piece of what you learn, but also remember that it's not the answer to valuation. I don't think anybody out there has the answer to valuation. Valuation is a process. It's going to be very individualized. I like to argue that valuation is as much of an art as it is a science. The science is understanding what things drive value. The art is trying to come up with what factors are going to influence your model. And those are going to depend on how you interpret information about the company, about the economy, about competitors, things like that. Also, another disclaimer. This is not a commentary on Chipotle. As a matter of fact, I love Chipotle. It's one of the places that I eat regularly, but it's more just a matter of walking through the valuation process. And you can love a company and not want to buy their stock. You can think a company is only okay, but the valuation is there that you would want to buy the stock. So keep in mind, valuation analysis is not saying, hey, this is a good company that we like, or this is a bad company that we don't like. It's looking at what the stock should be worth based on your analysis and then comparing that to the stock price. If Chipotle has a value of, let's say, $850 and it's trading for $1,200, I may think it's the best company out there, but I still don't want to buy the stock because it's overvalued. If I look at a different company that maybe I don't care for as much, but 
I think their stock is worth $800 per share and it's trading for $200 per share, all of a sudden I'm much more interested in that stock as an investment. So try to take away your viewpoint of what you think about the company as a consumer. Now, to some extent, that's still important because consumers drive revenues, but you want to think beyond just the consumer of whether you like that company or not. You want to think of where their position in the market is, what competitors they have, all kinds of things along those lines. Okay, so all those disclaimers aside, now let's get into the valuation model. And if you remember from the previous video, part one of building the valuation model, I had an income statement, balance sheet, and statement of cash flows. Now, ultimately, what's going to drive my valuation process is this statement of cash flows. Remember, I like a discounted cash flow model, so my valuation process is going to be based on estimating the cash flows that the company is going to generate, choosing a discount rate, and solving for the present value of those cash flows. In order to do that, I'm going to start with the income statement. I've got to forecast what revenues are going to be. I've got to forecast what expenses are going to be. Ultimately, that's going to give me net income. And the reason I need that is if we go back to the statement of cash flows, you'll notice the starting point up here is net income. Net income drives the statement of cash flows. Once you have net income, you add back in depreciation and amortization because those are non-cash expenses. They've lowered your net income, but they don't hurt the company as far as its ability to generate cash flows. There's also other adjustments to operating cash flows. So if your accounts receivables go up, for example, what that means is you've sold more items, your revenue has increased, but you haven't collected on those accounts receivables. So your cash flows are actually going to be a little bit lower than the income statement says. On the other hand, if your accounts receivable go down, that means you've collected more receivables than you've sold. So your actual cash flows are going to be a little bit higher in that period. You're also going to have inventories. You're going to have accounts payable. Lots of different values are going to affect that. And so we're going to have to forecast what those adjustments are. You're also going to have your capital expenditures. How much does the company need to reinvest? So we're looking at Chipotle here. How does Chipotle grow? Two ways that Chipotle is going to see growth. Actually, three ways Chipotle can see growth. One is more people come to their existing restaurants. As they have more customers, their revenue should increase. Another way Chipotle can grow is if they can increase prices. If they can raise the price of a burrito bowl or raise the price of tacos or raise the price of chips or drinks or anything that they sell, they can bring in more revenues. Now, both of those do not necessarily require additional capital expenditures. There will be some. For example, if Chipotle has a store open and it's been open for 10 years, they probably need to refresh it a little bit. So they need to spend some money on keeping it up to date. However, one of the biggest ways Chipotle is going to grow is by opening new restaurants. As Chipotle opens a new restaurant, they're gonna have the opportunity to generate more revenues. And so Chipotle has lots of opportunity to open more restaurants, and that's gonna be one of the factors that's gonna be driving their growth. But opening those new restaurants requires that they purchase property and equipment, that they get leases, things like that. So those are going to involve capital expenditures. And those capital expenditures are going to lower the cash flows. So now let's go back to the income statement. And the income statement is where we start our forecasting process. And if you look at the income statement, the first line that I'm going to forecast, so 2017, 2018, 2019, those are historical. I took those numbers from Chipotle's 10K. I knew exactly what those numbers were going to be. I don't know what 2020 is. We're only partway through 2020. 
I think Chipotle is going to announce their second quarterly results sometime later this month. Again, this is July 2020. However, even after that, we're only halfway through, so we've still got two more quarters or half a year to go. As of right now, I know data for one quarter of 2020. And to top it off, this has not been a normal year by any stretch of the means, given that we're in the midst of the COVID-19 global pandemic. And if you've been following the news, the new cases in the US are relatively high at this point. So this is not something that's likely to disappear in the next week or two. So I'm going to have to forecast revenues. So how do I forecast revenues? Well, you can see there's a formula here, D2 times one plus forecast A4. So D2 is the previous year's revenue, and this forecast is going to be my forecasted growth rate. Now, one of the things when I teach classes, this is an area that students really struggle with. How do we know what revenues are going to be next year? Newsflash, you don't. Nobody can tell you what revenues are going to be for next year, are for 2021, 2022, all those years out into the future. You have to come up with your forecast for what you think revenues are going to be. So how do you do that? Well, one thing that you can do is look at previous sales growth patterns. So I'm going to jump to this forecast tab. And you can see here I've got my sales growth forecast for 2020, 2021, 22, and so on for X number of years. So how do I come up with these numbers that go in here? Well, one thing I can do is say, well, what sales growth been historically? So if I look at Chipotle, I've got three years of data here. Three years gives me two growth rates. Now, ideally, I'd have four or five or six years to get a bigger picture, but we have to be careful going back too far and we have to think about special situations. What do I mean by special situations? Well, if you're familiar with Chipotle, one of the big challenges that they've had over the past few years is they had a food safety issue come up. A lot of people were getting sick after eating at Chipotle. And by a lot of people, it's one of those things where it was actually a relatively small number of people. But when people get sick eating out, that tends to generate a lot of bad publicity. Chipotle went through kind of an overhaul of their food safety standards. Chipotle had a little bit of an image issue that they were dealing with for a while. And since then, they've knocked the ball out of the park as far as recovering their image. But if I look back at growth in 2015 to 16, 2016 to 17, those numbers might be a little misleading as far as my growth rate. As a matter of fact, this 2017 to 2018, you could argue is probably a little bit lower than normal because that was a kind of the tail end of as they were recovering from their food safety issues. But one way to look at growth rates is to say, well, what have they historically been? So I'm going to take a look at Chipotle's 2018 divided by 2017 and then subtract one. You don't need to make a conversion to percentage but I tend to do that just visually. It looks a little bit nicer. So they grew at 8.7%. Now I want to also look at 2018 to 2019 and there they grew at 14.83%. Note I could just drag that formula across because I used relative cell references. And so I was just going from this year to next year, same, format on the formula. So I can see that roughly they've been growing at about 9% and 15% over the last couple of years. There's some acceleration there that I want to look at. And one of the things you want to do is try to look back over the last few years of a company 
and you might see that if their sales have grown at, let's say, 3.5%, 3 3.8%, 3.7%, 4%, you're probably not going to want to forecast the 15% growth rate, right? Because their sales growth over the last few years has been pretty steady between three and a half and 4%. Maybe they go to 4.2% sales growth or 4.3%. Maybe they fall back to 3.6%. But you're probably not going to see a sales growth of negative 20% or a sales growth of 30% for that company. It just doesn't fit their pattern. Now, the exception to that would be if there's some huge news flow that's going to change that pattern. If there is some huge news flow, that's going to maybe play a part. So one area I start is to look at historical data and say, what has the company grown at over the past few years? Here you can see looking at Chipotle, we see high single digit to low double digit growth rates. If you forecasted 15%, that would be reasonable. If you forecasted 20%, probably wouldn't be out of line. If you said, hey, COVID is going to have a big impact on their sales growth this year, we should probably lower that dramatically. That makes sense as well. So you're going to have to adjust from looking at historical to also taking in news flow. Are there any strategic initiatives that the company is putting in? Is Chipotle developing new products that they're going to introduce to the market? New products can have a big impact on revenue. Did they undertake an acquisition? One of the companies that I use in my investments class is Winnebago. And Winnebago for several years was a fairly steady company producing RVs, recreational vehicles, the big motorhomes that you see driving down the highway. Over the last probably seven, eight years, they've been much more aggressive in acquisitions. They purchased a towable company, still in the RV framework, but a little bit different type of company. They purchased Chris Craft Boats, so that changed their structure a little bit. They purchased another large RV company a while ago. As they make these acquisitions, it changes the growth rate of the company. So you have to factor that in. Another thing to think about is how big is the potential market? So Chipotle sells Mexican or Tex-Mex type fast food, quick service restaurant. How big is their market? Well, how big is their market in the US? Can they expand internationally? All those things are things you're going to have to think about. How many people go out to eat on a regular basis? Well, of those people that go out to eat, do they always go to a place like Chipotle? Or do sometimes they go to a Chili's or a steakhouse? Or do sometimes they go to McDonald's? They want burgers and fries. Do they go for pizza? Do they eat in? Lots of things to think about for how big is the potential market. Now, I mentioned strategic initiatives. One of the things Chipotle has done, and I would call it a brief experiment, is they've tried a couple of different restaurant chain lines. They tried a Asian restaurant chain line called Chop House, and they've since discontinued that. They have a very small presence in the pizza market, Pizzeria Locale, and I think they've got three restaurants there. They've had a few for a while. Is that an area they're going to go into? I don't know but that's something I would have to think about. We also have to think about competition. Who is their competition? Is there gonna be a new company that comes out in a similar market that's going to take away from Chipotle? Um, strategic initiatives. How are they handling digital orders? Actually, that's one of the things that's helped Chipotle over the COVID crisis. A lot of people are still comfortable with takeout or delivery food. Chipotle is, has an app that works very well for ordering. It's very convenient to go pick it up. So a lot of people are still eating Chipotle even if they're not going to the restaurant. That's a factor that's going to be impacting their sales. Probably want to look at is there any regulatory issues that are going to affect their sales. All these different factors that are going to impact the sales are going to be important. 
how much does it cost to acquire a new company or a new customer? That's going to be part of your modeling. Maybe not just in the revenue perspective, but in the expenses. So these are all things that you're going to have to think about. And don't take these numbers that I put in as set numbers that are locked in. Now, one other thing that I want to mention real quick is if you look at my model, you'll see that I forecast out to 2027. Why 2027? Why not 2024? Why not 2030? Well, if you think of valuation, valuation for a stock is the present value of all the expected cash flows that the company is going to generate over its lifetime. Do I think Chipotle is going to cease to exist as a company in 2027? No, no not. I plan to be eating burrito bowls for long after that. However, I can't forecast out forever. If I want to try to forecast the next 100 years, I'm going to have a real big problem because one, I can look at 2020 and I know what's going on right now in the economy, the industry. I can say, well, I can project what's going to happen in 2021. I can project a little bit in 2022, but what's going to happen to the accuracy of my projections each year I go out? Is my projection for 2025 going to be as good as my projection for 2021? No, it's not going to be close. At some point, my ability to project, especially on a year by year basis, is going to be pretty much a random number generator. So at some point, I need to stop forecasting. And where you stop is going to be, depend on your outlook for the company, how predictable you think it is, what's going on, things like that. So if I was doing this for a class and I had a student that stopped projecting cash flows in 2023, that's fine. If I have somebody that projects out to 2030, that's fine. If I have somebody projecting out to 2062, that's probably a little bit carried away. So you've got to use your judgment as to where you're going to stop forecasting. Now, the good news is you're not saying the company stops here. You're still going to allow cash flows to continue to grow and we use a terminal valuation approach for that. So you can use a constant growth. You can use an H model. You can use a no growth model to say what the value of all the remaining cash flows are going to be. And then you're going to discount that back to today. Now, I've noticed this video is already up to about 22 minutes. I don't want to make three hour videos. So I'm going to go ahead and stop this video and then we'll start another one in a little bit.